it is indeed remarkable that you can be so precise, 13.7 billion years. And here we as a species have had a few thousand years of sentient life and a few hundred years of scientific life, and yet you're able to be so precise in the age of the universe, 13.7 years, a billion years. <laughs> How is that possible? How could you know the age of the universe so precisely 13.7 billion years? It, it's been a challenge to measure the age accurately. In fact, it's taken decades for us to get the kind of precision that we now have. And, uh, in fact, when Hubble first measured an age for the universe, he got an age something like 2 billion years for the age, um, which in fact was younger than the ages that had been dated uh, for rocks on Earth by geologists. Um, and so it's, it's been a, a, a difficult path to measuring the age accurately. And one of the things Hubble could not have foreseen was that there are, um, and I don't want to start off with the systematics, sorry. Okay, so, let's start here. Yes, go, go. There are a number of developments that have happened in the last couple of decades that have made more accurate measurements possible. One was the development of new detectors that we could use that replace photographic plates, the, the photographic plates that Edwin Hubble had available to him. And we can now make much more uh, precise measurements of how bright the stars that we have to measure the, the um, period variations in. Uh, another is that we were able, with the um, launch of the Hubble Space Telescope, to get above the atmosphere of the Earth. And when we observe from telescopes on the ground, we have to look through the Earth's atmosphere, which is turbulent, it's in motion, and it tends to blur out the light coming from distant objects. So if we're trying to see one of these Cepheid variables that's located in a galaxy with 100 billion stars, the light gets smeared out, it's harder to make an accurate measurement. If we get above the Earth's atmosphere as Hubble is orbiting um, and make measurements from space, then we can make much more precise observations. Um, another difficulty that Hubble could not possibly have foreseen is that so stars in the course of their evolution produce grains um, that the effect of these grains is to uh, absorb um, some of the radiation that's coming from a distant Cepheid. It makes the, the um, star appear both redder and fainter. He didn't know of the existence of this intervening dust and we can now make measurements, very precise measurements, to correct for that. You have used different measurements in addition to the Cepheid variable stars so that you don't rely on just one measurement but have several independent measurements that can all target the same number which can use to calculate the age. So tell us some of these other uh, uh, parameters that are able to help. So in addition to the Cepheids, but we, we can measure distances to galaxies using Cepheids only out to some finite distance. Um, and beyond that, there are a number of other methods that have been developed that we can apply the Cepheid distances to. So in a sense, it's like rungs on a ladder. Um, and so, for example, we can observe very bright objects called supernovae. These are um, explosions at the end of lifetimes of stars that are extremely bright. They, in fact, can be, the explosion itself can be as bright as the entire galaxy in which the supernova resides. And so we can make these measurements out over a much um, larger distance. So that's one method. We don't have to rely on a single method anymore, but at all the rungs of the ladder, we have checks and balances to see how well the distances are, are agreeing. If they don't agree, we know that there's a problem. So in fact, in, in the course of our project with the Hubble Space Telescope, um, a large group of us made measurements of five different methods. So we measured the distances to galaxies containing Cepheids and then applied those distances to these other five methods. And what we found in the end was that the agreement was very good. It might not have turned out that way. Could have been that there'd be a huge range, a huge dispersion, but in fact the measurements of each of the five independent techniques agreed very well. So it, a number of improvements have occurred to let us make these measurements much more accurately. So you're very confident, 13.7 billion, right? <laughs> <laughs> you want me to go into the uncertainties? There? <laughs> so there, before we started these measurements, there was a debate in, in the community about the age at, at, at the level of a factor of two. Was the universe 10 billion years or was the universe 20 billion mm -hmm. years old? And what we've been able to do now is make a measurement at a 10% accuracy, a huge improvement over what we could do before. 
Uh, and then there have been recent observations using completely different techniques, actually measuring the background radiation from the Big Bang. It's an independent estimate of the age, which agrees with ours extremely well. The microwave. The microwave background. The key number that you've been searching for, that you and your group have in fact targeted, is what's been called the Hubble constant. Tell us how that works. So the Hubble constant relates the velocity of expansion for a galaxy to its distance. So this is Hubble's original discovery when he realized there was a relationship between velocity and distance. The proportionality constant is the Hubble constant. It tells you um, that if you measure a certain distance, uh, you multiply by the Hubble constant and you get the velocity to a galaxy. So determining um, the slope of this relationship is um, the expansion rate at the current time, and we call that the Hubble constant. Okay, we now know the universe is expanding, and expanding according to the Hubble constant, and so we can run the movie back in reverse to get the time of origin 13.7 billion years ago. But in 1998, something new was put into our heads that instead of the universe expanding but gradually slowing in expansion due to gravity, which was the natural expectation, data started to come in weekly at first but then more that the expansion wasn't decelerating because of gravity but was incredibly, mind-blowingly, accelerating in its expansion. And many people didn't believe that at first. Should we believe? So even up to 10 years ago, I think the expectation of astronomers, cosmologists, anyone you would have asked was that if you went out and you could make measurements at even greater distances than we make measurements of the local expansion rate, you would expect because you're looking back further, you're looking earlier uh, in time in the evolution of the universe, that you would see the effects of the universe slowing down, that the universe would be decelerating because of the presence of matter and matter interacts via gravity. Gravity is attractive. It slows things down. Um, what happened instead was that um, a group went out to make measurements of supernovae. And what they found was the supernovae are fainter than you would expect if the universe had been slowing down. Um, as if the universe had actually been speeding up. The distances between the objects in the intervening time had actually increased uh, over time. And you could look at this and say, well, there must be some other effect that's causing it. What's, what gives here? Um, another group jumped into the picture, got the same result. Subsequently, there are other groups using different measurements that have confirmed that measurement. It looks to be, according to current evidence, um, the best explanation. Oh, sorry. I don't want to Okay. Um, it, it looks to be, um, uh, it, sorry. It looks currently as if the universe is actually taking part in an overall acceleration. Not only is it expanding, but the expansion is speeding up with time. So what are the implications for that, for the structure of the universe, uh, this expansion? What's causing it? And is that this new form of energy that we hear called dark energy? We, we don't know what's causing this acceleration. Um, it appears, in fact, it's consistent with Einstein's general theory of relativity. Um, he added into his equations early on because he didn't think the universe was expanding. There was no evidence for an expansion of the universe. He added in a term to force the universe to be static and not to move. Um, it turns out that the term he added in, which he later regretted because after Edwin Hubble discovered the expansion, he didn't need it anymore, may be the explanation for this mysterious new kind of energy that is like a repulsive form of gravity. It's actually repulsive rather than attractive. And he called that the cosmological constant? He called that constant. the cosmological constant. Um, and and um, it, we don't yet understand the reasons for a cosmological constant. He just added it in as a, a, a term in his mathematical equations. Today we understand the cosmological constant more as a, a reflection of the fact that in empty space there's actually a lot of activity. There are particles and antiparticles. There's energy in the vacuum of space. The problem is if you compute what the magnitude of this energy is, it's a, 120 orders of magnitude greater than what we measure.
might as well be zero. That's an unbelievable, but it's not zero. It's not zero. It's not zero. Uh, so not only is it large, but it's small. I mean, <laughs> so, sorry, I don't want to say it that way. No, That's but, true. It, but it's true, but not only is it not zero, not only is it not zero, but it's a tiny amount, and we don't have an explanation right now for what that is. It's one of the biggest mysteries right now in all of particle physics and cosmology.